In this chapter, we'll be discussing biological rhythms, including the circadian rhythm, the neural basis of the biological clock, the sleep cycle and the sleep stages. We'll also be chatting about why we sleep, what is dreaming and why we need to dream, or theories as to why we need to dream, and we'll end with sleep disorders. So what are biological rhythms? Biological rhythms are inherent timing mechanisms that control or initiate various biological processes. They are linked to the cycle of days and seasons produced by the Earth's rotation around the sun. In support of this, animals living near the poles of the Earth are more affected by seasonal changes than animals living in equatorial regions. While lots of species are governed by various biological rhythms, Human behavior is in particular governed by more daily cycles than by seasonal cycles. Here is a basic cycle. The seasons change, of course, as the Earth revolves around the Sun, and each revolution takes one year. The tilt of the Earth on its axis is what actually determines seasons. So it's easy to forget that at the other side of the world right now, they'll be entering their winter season just as we are entering our summer season at the point that this lecture has been recorded. Day and night also result from the rotation of the Earth on its axis every 24 hours. So when it is noon here on the other side of the world, it will be midnight. To regulate our biological rhythms, we have a biological clock. Behavior is not simply driven by external cues from the environment. Biological rhythms are actually endogenous. That means that the control comes from within our bodily system. Our biological rhythms are controlled by our biological clock. Our biological clock is a neural system that times behavior. It allows animals to anticipate events before they happen. For example, birds migrate before it gets cold. And we know that the sun is going to rise before the sun rises, and we know that the sun is going to set before the sun sets. One of the most important aspects of our biological clock is the circadian sleep cycles that are dependent upon it. Virtually all physiological, biochemical, and behavioral processes show some circadian rhythm. Temperature, hormones, for example, are all influenced by circadian rhythms. If you look down here at this nice little table, here are the type of biological rhythms you can have. You can have circa annual, which is a yearly time frame. An example would be the migration cycles of birds. You can have circadian, which is daily. An example would be the human wake sleep cycle, which we'll be talking about in the next few slides. We also have ultraradian, which would be less than one day. So human eating cycles, that means that the, there's a cycle takes less than one day. So our human eating cycles are less than one day. We will eat multiple times within one day. And infraradian, that means that a cycle takes more than one day. An example is the human menstrual cycle, which occurs on a roughly 28-day cycle. So we have free-running rhythms rhythms of the body's own devising in the absence of all external cues, and these free-running rhythms are regulated by our biological clock. So even without input from external cues, our bodies have their own rhythms within a period of 25 to 27 hours. So it's hard to imagine a circumstance where we would have no external cues, but if you were to extrapolate on some of the movies that have come out or could be coming out at some point in the future uh, after some sort of apocalypse we could be finding ourselves in a deep dark isolated hole or enclosure in which we do not have access to the sun or any clocks or anything like that and so even if we had no external cues we did not see the sun and we did not have access to a clock and we were all hiding in a post-apocalyptic cave, our bodies would have their own rhythm that would roughly correspond to a 25 to 27 hour cycle, so roughly about a day. 
Generally, though, we have external cues that we use to entrain and direct our circadian cycles. These external cues are known as Zeitgerbers, which is a very cool name. So sunlight, clocks, these are all things that can be external cues. We use these external cues to, again, guide our behavior. So after the time changes, for example, when we have daylight savings time, then the clock, looking at the changed clock, is going to help uh, retrain our circadian cycles to align with the new time change. And here is a nice little video that presents some of the key aspects of our biological clock. The clock regulates everything you do, which is why it's too bad that it needs to be rewound so much. Anthony here for D News, and you know that you have an internal clock. You get tired around the same time every day. You wake up around the same time. You have a basic idea of how much time is passing without having to check. Your biological clock is this precision timepiece in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN. It's made up of 20,000 neurons that control all the other timing mechanisms of your body, your sleep cycle, your metabolism, hormone production, even cell division. There are 1,440 minutes in a day, and the SCN counts them with only a 1% to 2% margin of error and keeps it running smoothly. It's called the circadian rhythm. So these 20,000 neurons are working together. They have to be able to stay in sync, right? And that takes constant work from a neurotransmitter chemical called GABA. The SCN also takes clues from outside stimuli, particularly sunlight, because we're diurnal animals. As the sun starts rising later or the days get longer, your clock slowly adjusts to make sure that you're set up to be active at the right parts of the day. Now, the downside is that the internal clock is delicate. It doesn't respond well to big changes in your routine or in nature. A sudden upset to your circadian rhythm can cause your hormone regulation to be out of sync, as well as your wake-sleep patterns and your times of peak productivity. That's why we're so affected by things like daylight savings time and jet lag, but subtler things can throw you off. And a long-term problem with your internal clock can cause serious health issues. For instance, a study conducted by Northwestern University showed that if your school or office doesn't get enough daylight, you will wind up getting about 45 minutes less sleep a night than people who work in a well-lit building, and the sleep is lower quality overall. And another study from Harvard showed that working just one night shift can impair your glucose tolerance. And in the long term, that can lead to obesity and even type 2 diabetes. Some people have a biological clock that's off to begin with. Somewhere between 7 and 16% of children and teenagers have delayed sleep phase disorder. People with DSPD can't get to bed before 2 or 3 a.m. and nothing gets them up on time. It's different than insomnia because you can get to sleep and it's around the same time every night. It's a full sleep cycle. It's just shifting. It goes away for most people in adulthood, but it can continue, especially in people with ADHD, and research points toward them being genetically linked. A few treatments can be used to reset your internal clock. Phototherapy involves either actively staying out in the sun longer in the early hours of the day or getting a special light that can replace it. Avoiding bright screens or electronics at night can help your clock know when it's time to wind down. Doctors can also help, obviously, with sleep medication. I had crazy DSPD when I was a kid, and I still fight with it a lot now. How about you? How's your internal clock running, Internet? Let me know and subscribe for more D News. So that's a nice video that covers aspects of your biological clock, and we'll be talking about more of the details that were presented in that video in the next upcoming slides. Zeitgerbers are any environmental event that entrains biological rhythms. So an example is light, and this was briefly talked about in the video. Light is something that entrains or guides your biological clock. So what is entrainment? Entrainment is determination or modification of the period of a biorhythm. So when you see light, for example, as the day lengthens, summer gets closer and closer, then this will modify your biological clock to stay up a little bit later. If you were also to fly from here to Paris, which of course is on a different time zone, then the light that you would see, as well as the clocks that you would see, would signal your biological clock that an adjustment needs to be made to align yourself with 
the daytime at your current location. So this is why jet lag can result in such fatigue and disorientation because the rapid travel through time zones results in an exposure to a changed light and dark cycle that wants to entrain your biological clock. So what is the neural basis of the biological clock? It is a collection of cells known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I happen to really like suprachiasmatic. It sounds a little bit like some Mary Poppins version of neuroscience. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the main pacemaker of the circadian rhythms and it's located just, be of, just above your optic chiasm. And if you recall, your optic chiasm is the place where the two optic nerves from your eyes cross. So it's a really nice position because it will receive input from two eyes. Your suprachiasmatic nucleus is your master clock. The pathway from your receptors in your eyes to the suprachiasmatic nucleus is known as your retinohypothalamic pathway. And this is the route from a subset of cone receptors in your retina to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And this is this pathway allows light to entrain the rhythmic activity of the SCN. There are other pacemakers that exist in the retina and pineal gland, but the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the main one. So what is it that these suprachiasmatic rhythms do? If your SCN is damaged, then what happens is that daily activities occur, but they occur very haphazardly. In other words, they can't actually form a set pattern. One of the things that your SCN does is it will signal when you should have changes in metabolism, when you should prepare for sleep. So if these things were to happen haphazardly, then they wouldn't correspond and you might have an increase in metabolism at a time when you would be preparing for sleep or you would have a release of hormones and your SCN would encourage cell division and growth at wrong times of the day. SCN cells are more metabolically active during periods of light, and cells are also more electrically active during that time. SCN neurons also maintain rhythmic activity in the absence of input or light. So while they are more reactive to light, they don't actually need any light to maintain the rhythmic activity that would be used to signal your own biological rhythms. The SCN neurons are so good at keeping time that if they are actually isolated from one another, each remains rhythmic, but the rhythmicity of some of the cells is different from that of other cells. So the timing of the rhythm must be set so that the cells can both synchronize their activity in relation to each other and in relation to Zeitgerber's. So these cells are really good at keeping their rhythmicity, but the cells are going to respond to different Zeitgerber's and to each other. So they want to be in timing and in communication so that your biological clock will be able to adjust appropriately to stimuli in the environment. Here's the pathway that this light information travels. So here's your eyes, okay? And so you actually have photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that respond specifically to blue light that form this retinohypothalamic pathway. And here is the optic chiasm where they cross. And then again, these they pass into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which has two parts. It has a core and it has a shell. And so signals from the SCN core, this area right here, these actually entrain neurons in the suprachiasmatic shell. So just to review, we have blue light waves that are that activate these photosensitive retinal ganglion cells here. These blue light waves are especially sensitive. Now think for a second about why it might be that blue light waves would be especially important for activating your SEN. So why would the blue wavelength be particularly important for detecting daylight? So now that you've had just a second, of course I have no idea if you've actually thought of the correct answer or not, but we're going to review it here. The main reason that these cells would be especially sensitive to blue light would be that the sky is blue. And you have, again, three types of cone cells. 
you have cone cells that are sensitive to short wavelength, which is blue light, and then you also have cells that are sensitive to red and green wavelengths. And if you look back at earlier vision chapters or recall that red and green wavelength are closer to each other on the spectrum of light than blue. So blue is short and red and green are longer. So in addition to the fact that the sky is being blue, what these are really sensing is short wavelengths. So the short wavelength comes in that generally corresponds to this blue sky. And uh, uh, this, again, light from the sun, and you have a great deal of light that is reflected off of the blue sky that would, even in times of cloudiness, be picked up. And this here information would be sent to the core uh, neurons within the SCN. And as this daylight information is received, then this would entrain or signal the neurons in the shell portion of the SCN to adapt their activity. And then the SCN, this impacts slave oscillators and receives signals from other brain and body areas. So basically, basically the SCN receives this continual information regarding whether it is night and day, and it will signal to the rest of the body accordingly. You should increase your metabolism, you should decrease your metabolism, you should increase hormones, decrease hormones, uh, so on and so forth. Give you an example of a type of hormone that is released in relationship to sleep is melatonin. We talked about this earlier in when we in the chapter that we discussed and presented hormones. Melatonin is a hormone that is synthesized from serotonin in the pineal gland during the dark phase of the day-night cycle. Melatonin influences daily and seasonal biorhythms. Melatonin levels also follow circadian rhythms and it's controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Melatonin is not a sleep aid per se, but many people use it to try to shift their circadian rhythm. It works better for some people than others to help with sleep, but that difference is likely due to the ability to absorb it. So some people are able to absorb the melatonin that can be received through supplements, and other individuals, when they have melatonin supplements, it does not actually affect their sleep due to low absorption. So to just give you a brief idea as to why you might have this difference, when if you were to take a tablet of melatonin to try to influence your sleep, one, you should be taking it early enough in the day or early enough in the evening, excuse me, to influence the secretion of melatonin at the time of sleep. But two, when you eat anything, whether it's a uh, apple or a melatonin supplement, it gets digested in your gut and everyone's gut is filled with all sorts of different bacteria and a whole biome that is involved in digesting it. And based upon the biome that is in your gut, that can uh, significantly affect your absorption. There's also differences in how food is absorbed as a function of uh, glucose metabolism uh, and as well as how much fat you have in your body because fat also will release hormones and it will influence uh, metabolic activity. So there's all sorts of reasons as to why some people would could benefit from melatonin in terms of improving sleep and others will not. And I'm just giving some of these some of these potential examples as a way for you to evaluate and understand uh, individual differences in these types of in the effectiveness of uh, medications or supplements such as melatonin.